So, keep this short, but uh, very excited to have Jake Elliott here today. And um, <clears throat> he's going to talk about um, Game Project as well as other work. And I think uh, I'm particularly excited to have Jake here because there aren't that many people around that I think bridge um, media art and art and music and games and the things kind of merge into each other. You see a lot of separation between indie game culture and art culture, a lot of sometimes animosity and mutual suspicion. And I think it's important that there's people around who embrace both worlds and kind of dispel the tension that I feel sometimes between those worlds and bring bring aesthetics and sensibilities from one world to the other. So I'm excited about that. Um, and I don't know, I guess we'll have some time for Q&A at the end. Um, two other members of the Kentucky Route Zero team are here also. Um, so I think that would be <laughs> exciting. So um, Tomas and Ben, right? So um, maybe, maybe at the end they could come up for Q&A and &A such. And uh, we're also doing a workshop on Thursday with... Um, Jake and Tomas in the game lab where they're going to open up some of the behind the scenes of how Kentucky Route Zero is made and how it works. So for anyone who's a maker um, and wants to see a little bit of the workflow and how they work on stuff, I think that will be really enlightening. So that'll be from 12 to 2 on Thursday. All right. So um, help me welcome Jake. <laughs> Thanks, Ido. Thanks, everybody, for, uh, for having us here, for having me here. Um, yeah, this is what's running right now. This is our game that we work on, Kentucky Red Zero. Just wanted to just make sure that got up there at some point, so there was like at least a tiny bit of context for what I was about to say. Um, let's see. My uh, sort of presentation technology today is this finder window full of junk. So um, if it's a little bit awkward, I apologize in advance. Um, so this evening, I guess, um, I wanted to talk with y'all a little bit about um, Cardboard Computer as a collaborative project, as a uh, art collective or an, uh, you know, an art making project um, that has pre-existed the existence of the game Kentucky Route Zero that we're working on now that we've been working on for the last four years or so. Um, because this project uh, really started about 10 years ago when uh, Tomas Kamensi and I met in art school at the School of the Arts Institute of Chicago. Um, and, you know, I think really uh, a lot of like what goes into Kentucky Route Zero uh, can be pretty easy, or it's easy for, for us, I think, to trace it very naturally to some other kind of earlier work that we were doing that wasn't really in the context of being a video game at all. Um, so I just have a sort of a, a slice backwards or sort of a, a trail backwards through some of our work um, and I want to look at a few different themes that came out in some of this early work and, and how they manifest themselves now in Kentucky Red Zero. Um, <clears throat> so the uh, first kind of theme that I want to play with a little bit is this idea of, of uh, histories um, and look at some of our early work that uh, is really concerned with um, with digging back into art histories or kind of pretty recent art histories, uh, media art histories um, having to do with early video art. Uh, so, let's see. So back when, oh yeah, let me share this one first. Um, Tomas and I first met in this class uh, at the School of the Arts Institute of Chicago that was taught by our friend John Cates. Uh, this class is called Prehistories of New Media. So this was kind of like an uh, introductory media art histories class that studied early video art, um, conceptual art, stuff like Saul LeWitt, um, that would kind of, uh, that could be read as kind of like presaging uh, digital art and software art. So for example, looking at the kind of instruction set um, drawings and sculptures of Saul LeWitt as kind of um, 
pieces of code or something like that. Um, Presaging work in the 90s that like net artwork and software artwork that was about um, like executing um, like executing software as a, as a sort of material. It's like looking at um, these instruction sets as materials. Also looking back at uh, Fluxus art, uh, instruction sets and kind of like um, instruction games from Yoko Ono and folks like that um, in the 60s. And uh, I'll, uh, this, so this class was taught by our friend John Cates who also had this project uh, at the time called Critical Artware, which I had open here. Um, this is a kind of like weird, super lo-fi representation of what critical artware was, but critical artware was a, a group, a sort of art historical group that was uh, invested in doing interviews with early video artists, um, talking to folks like Jane Veter and Dan Sandeen and other folks, a lot of whom were based in Chicago, um, who had been making video art in the 70s and the 60s, 70s and 80s, uh, and were still kind of around and working uh, some of them, like Dan Sandine, uh, you know, worked at UIC and continued to work with, oh, so Dan Sandine made this kind of uh, really cool early analog video synthesizer. Let me open that up here. Okay. Called the Sandine Image Processor, which looked a, a little bit like this. So here's Dan Sandine. Um, not to explain it carefully enough, so I want to be able to walk up. Is a uh, and the Sandine image processor developed in Chicago in the I think early 70s. Is that right? Is that sound right to you? Yeah. Um, analog computer, analog to distinguish it. So and Dan, you know, stuck around in Chicago. He worked on a virtual reality environment called the Cave, uh, and he's worked on some other kind of like more uh, digital software-based, um, you know, approaches to to visual art making, digital art making. Uh, this video is really cool because he's explaining how the image processor works, this big like analog modular synthesizer for video that's behind him, um, but he's also feeding this live video feed of his instructions through the image processor so you can see what these different controls do. So Critical Artware was doing interviews with people like this and, you know, asking them um, to kind of historicize themselves in relation to software art that came later, you know, it's like how is... Um, how was what you were doing back then? How could that be read as a sort of because configuration these are also of software? Controllable, I can have that function performed by a control voltage, which presently is being generated. But you know, we were also uh, critical art. Was also really invested in um, making contemporary art, uh, and I'll show a little bit of what came out of that when Tomas and I joined um, a little bit later. But um, we were, you know, kind of thinking of our own art making practice as being like a kind of hybrid between researching, doing art historical research in these interviews and creating, you know, kind of concrete original research, um, but also like, you know, a kind of like live contemporary art making practice. Um, so John Cates from Critical Artware and Tomas and I um, <clears throat> worked on this project that John concepted that was, uh, had a kind of weird name. It was called The Guardians of the Tradition. Um, which I actually have no memory of like where that name came from. I don't think I would call a project that now. It sounds like a little bit weird and elitist and ivory tower. Uh, I have a feeling it was probably satirical when we came up with it, like it was probably a joke. Um, but that was, we took on this name, the guardians of the tradition, and we, we um, sort of, uh, sorry, this is super tiny. We sort of uh, framed ourselves as this like art game uh, crew, you know, like an art game gi clan or guild, like a quake clan or guild. Um, and what, what we um, made as this art game guild, the Guardians of the Tradition, uh, first off we made some walkthroughs for other art games, like cheat codes for um, Cory Archangel's Super Mario Clouds, um, and we presented those in a gallery. And then we also made our own game, this game called SideQuest. Uh, here's some screenshots of SideQuest. So SideQuest was a sort of uh, remix of this game from 1973, I think, called uh, Colossal Cave Adventure. Um, or was it 70, anyway. So Colossal Cave Adventure, uh, of course, is uh, classically probably uh, the first adventure game designed by Will Crowther um, and Don Woods, later kind of like modified by Don Woods. Colossal Cave Adventure is a game about uh, spelunking in Mammoth Cave in Kentucky. 
uh, which Will Crowther made um, based on his experiences exploring the cave with his wife. Uh, they were both like avid spelunkers. His wife actually mapped out some regions of the um, mammoth cave system that hadn't been mapped out before, so they were pretty serious uh, spelunkers. And they also spent time there with their two young daughters. Uh, and then they went through a divorce, and um, Crowther, who was, a, I guess, like a Dungeons and Dragons player or something, was uh, thinking about you know ways that he could kind of stay connected with his daughters, even though he wasn't um, you know living in the same house as them anymore. So he designed this game, uh, Colossal Cave Adventure, that they could kind of play when they came to visit him, and they could kind of share these memories that they had of going and and exploring these caves as a family. Um, and this was like in a kind of pretty early. Um, you know, in the 70s, uh, so he, pretty early kind of computer software moment. So he didn't think about turning this into a product or anything. Um, he just, you know, he put it, he uploaded it to some of his, uh, some university servers, people played it, uh, and eventually people started editing and reworking it and adding things like trolls and monsters and magical words and other kind of like um, familiar Dungeons and Dragons elements. Um, so this Colossal Cave Adventure, you know, from very early on in its life was uh, a kind of a living text and it was always kind of getting reworked, right? So John's idea was to do a kind of modern, uh, another kind of reworking of Colossal Cave Adventure, a sort of art game reworking of it uh, that also drew on, um, you know, like kind of cut up texts, kind of like algorithmic Markov chain style, kind of like cut up texts, that kind of um, digital poetry code work kind of stuff that um, that, that we see a lot in the, you know, early 2000s. Um, so we took the original text from Colossal Cave Adventure and also folded in texts um, that we had written or collected that were some of them biographical texts about Will Crowther, the designer of the game. Some of them were uh, historical texts about the different buildings that he worked in. He was, he worked for the, um, he worked for the Stanford Artificial Intelligence Laboratory for a while, I think. Uh, he worked for some of these early kind of like military contractors that were building the technology that kind of formed the basis of the internet. So we took, you know, kind of wrote or um, collected texts like that to fold together to make this um, kind of like weird cut up um, interactive fiction piece. And this, um, this game that which we made in, you know, with John in 2009 uh, sort of stuck in our heads, in Tomas and, and my, our heads, um, specifically the subject matter about Mammoth Cave, uh, this kind of like weird magical cave in Kentucky that was the site of the first adventure game. It's the largest cave system on the earth um, as far as we know. Um, and just kind of hung around for a few years um, until we made Kentucky Route Zero, which is set in the same location, which um, we kind of knew from the beginning, uh, you know, since it sort of originated, the germ of it was in this uh, art historical project, kind of knew from the beginning that it had to be, um, it was going to be by its nature kind of really concerned with, with its own position in history and with the history that it was drawing on. Um, so I wanna show you a little bit from Kentucky Route Zero where this connection with Colossal Cave Adventure is really explicit. So this is a game, basically, uh, it's never really referred to as a game, but this is a piece of software um, that the characters in Kentucky Route Zero encounter in the third act. Um, the software's called Xanadu, and ostensibly it's a document of some things that happened to some other characters in the game, um, maybe 20 or 30 years before 
Kentucky Road Zero set. Um, but you know what it actually is, kind of materially, is uh, yet another remix of Colossal Cave Adventure. So this text, you're standing at the end of a road before a small brick building around you as a forest, is uh, you know an exact uh, lift from Colossal Cave Adventure. And actually, as many of the uh, room descriptions uh, as made sense are direct lifts from Colossal Cave Adventure. kind of minor intervention um, where I think the lamp in the shed in the beginning of Colossal Cave Adventure is like a sort of antique brass lamp and we made it a sensible modern electric lantern. Um, <laughs> I don't know why the original is too iconic or something. We wanted to just like make a little, um, a little edit there. <clears throat> uh, and then, you know, the machine that you're playing all of this on um, is a sort of, uh, it's, a, it's also a little bit of a historical edit. It's, it wouldn't be the actual machine that, um, that Will Crowther would have uh, first run uh, Colossal Cave Adventure on, but it has this like really cool looking monitor. So we went back a few extra years just so we could use this monitor. Um, the music uh, that Ben composed for this scene um, was performed on this modular synthesizer that you can kind of see in the background. It's also of, the, of a similar vintage, the Emu modular synthesizer. You can see it behind the, well, probably actually not in this light, but there, there's a, a, uh, an accurate reproduction of this old modular synthesizer behind the, the Teletype machine. Uh, also, the, um, there, so when you play this scene, you're um, playing a few different characters who are kind of watching the, the person who's in charge of the typing, and you get, kind of give him sug suggestions about things to try typing. Um, so uh, in classic interactive fiction form, a lot of uh, the things you might think to type, the parser just completely doesn't understand and barfs back some confusing error to you. Um, so I, I actually sourced all of those error texts by typing these phrases into the original Colossal Cave Adventure also to get the, um, the correct like error messages back. Um, so this is kind of like playful negotiation here with like whether we're going to be historically accurate or not and which aspects of the experience we want to be accurate historical portrayals and which ones we want to kind of take a more poetic approach to, to sort of recreating. Um, let's see, another scene where we're kind of uh, portraying historical, uh, important to us historical moments here is this... Uh, This scene, it's also in act three, um, where you're driving around through the cave and you encounter this kind of weird van. And you play as the dog in this scene. <laughs> and you have this kind of nonverbal experience, uh, uncharacteristically nonverbal for this game, which is, is verbal to a fault. Um, where you encounter this van that's playing some interesting music. The dog, of course, has really excellent hearing. So as you kind of move around the scene, you mostly, the most of the change that you experience is this uh, subtle changes in audio. And then these folks back here making video art. Um, so those folks, the guy with the hat, is this video artist, uh, this guy here. Sorry, this guy. Is this video artist who's um, very important to us, um, Phil Morton. He's also from Chicago and was part of that same community with Dan Sandine and some of these other artists that um, we were introduced to again by our friend John, who's um, a particularly an, an expert on, on this guy, Phil Morton, and runs an archive of his work now. Um, so I want to show you just a couple minutes of this um, Phil Morton video from 76, I think, called Colorful Colorado. Um, and, and then I'll, um, yeah, okay, I'm just going to show you like two minutes of it.
Uh, Mercy, we wanted to do some talking, so we thought cross eyed be a lot better, how about it? specific because um because we actually have used that in the game a little bit here soundtrack of that video is the sound of the engine for the truck because it's moving around it's a little bit hard to spot but um but you know i think like w w part of what we've taken from morton's work and and used in the game is just this like uh really spiritual relationship to the road you know um and a lot of a lot of his work is about him out in this van um or some of his some of his most interesting work for us is about him out in his van and um uh, the sort of like spiritual nature of that experience for him or, or kind of psychedelic nature of that experience for him. Um, let's see. And then there's one other kind of pretty, oh sorry, it's one other kind of pretty clear art historical shout out or intervention in the game, which is in, um, this is the first uh, interlude of the series so that the game is five episodes and then there are these um, small interludes in between each episode uh, that are sort of uh, detached a little bit from the rest of the game um, and in this one the first one is called limits and demonstrations which is set in a in an art gallery um, we have this piece uh, which I forget the full title of it overdubbed Namjoon Pike installation in the style of Edward Packer so this is a piece where we imagined what if one of the characters in the game's uh, artist named Lula Chamberlain, um, what if she was friends with Namjoon Pike and Edward Packer, who is an early um, Choose Your Own Adventure author, and um, they, they kind of made this collaborative work that's like a mashup of their, their various styles. So um, the original uh, piece here, uh, let's see if I can find it. This is the original Pike piece, Random Access, um, where it's, all, it's a bunch of like magnetic audio tape 
taped to the wall and uh, you have a playback head, like a tape playback head, and you run it across the tape and, and can listen to it. So um, we were imagining, you know, if Lula had uh, recorded, taken his piece and recorded over each individual strip of tape uh, some text and, and uh, turned it into like a choose your own adventure story uh, that you can navigate with these characters here. Um, again, most of Limits and Demonstrations is about these other three characters talking about the art that they're looking at. Um, so again, it's about, you know, we're, we're thinking about this works, like relationship, this, like Kentucky Route Zero's relationship to the media that, that, or the media and the art that kind of came before it and that set, you know, set up the context for us to work in. Um, but we're also like, um, kind of rewriting some of that history in a playful kind of, you know, poetic kind of way um, as a, you know, just like as a part of the expression of, of Kentucky Route Zero as a work. Okay. okay. I also want to talk about um, this, this theme coming out of our um, media artwork and video artwork about uh, kind of embracing brokenness um, and understanding that, that, that brokenness and failure is, is just gonna be a part, of, um, a part of the piece as it is. So I, I mentioned Tomas and I, um, at, we uh, sort of like joined up with this artist collective called Crit Critical Artware and they were you know, working um, mostly um, Mostly like looking at the oh sorry okay mostly looking at this like early video moment right from the um, 60s 70s and 80s um, but we through that experience working with them we kind of got interested in looking at some other kind of early moments that were um, that were really important to us that we we kind of also saw as like you know we can we can take these other kind of early moments and um, and reflect on them historically in a, in a similar kind of way by engaging with them directly, like not just by reading about them or writing about them, but by going there and meeting the people and talking to the people about their work in relationship to uh, this kind of contemporary work. So for us, one of those, um, one of those early moments was uh, this thing called the demo scene, uh, which is still around in some form, but had its really kind of had its heyday in the late 1980s. The demo scene was um, a community that grew out of software piracy, where uh, people would pirate games or uh, other applications, mainly games, because they were kids, uh, frankly. And so they would pirate these games, and then they would want to put a banner on the game to say who had pirated it or who had cracked the copy protection on it. And these banners got more and more fanciful and more and more uh, sort of like um, technically challenging and expressive until eventually these people were just exchanging the banners and they had given up with the kind of perfunctory um, attachment to the to the games they were cracking so uh, and they and they called them demos uh, you know the demos were in one sense a sort of demonstration of you know what the computer was capable of but more than that they were a demonstration of what the hacker was capable of right um, they were these were you know accompanied by a lot of bravado and a lot of um, yeah, nasty comments on the internet. Again, these are children. They're doing this now. These are teenagers or something. They're doing this. So um, we were like wanting to kind of look back at, at that kind of moment as like, you know, this is some super interesting early software art that predates like net art as we understand it, like web art or something. It predates that. It goes back to um, before the web as we know it. Um, and so we went to a demo party, uh, which is a demo parties are the, the kind of um, when, when these competitions get localized in a, in a real world place, they call it a party. Um, so we went to one that was in the United States um, that was in Cleveland. There's not a lot of these in the United States. Um, I don't know if there are any now, but this one at the time, Block Party, um, was in Cleveland. And, and we, were, we weren't there to represent critical art. We were there to kind of explore the demo scene and, and kind of like start talking to some of these folks about their practice and start thinking about how we could do, um, you know, how we could how we could maybe approach some work like that, but we didn't go there with anything in mind. Um, but then we decided once we were there to like make a demo and enter this kind of competition, and we gave it a really goofy name. We called it Chassis because it sounded like sort of meaningless and cool. Um, so this is basically what it looked like. It didn't really do much more than this. It was it was pretty hard to uh, build this like you know. Um, you know, there's some constraints about like file size and stuff like that. So we're 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 not like um, technically uh, 
I don't know, we're not like technical rock stars or something or anything like that. We do, you know, we get by um, w with what we have, but, but uh, this, you know, these demo parties are really about um, showing your technical mastery. So we got eighth place, which was like, which was last place. And, um, <laughs> you know, and, and it, we, we, they have to screen the demo, you know, everybody watches it and, and ours was pretty, pretty painful to watch. So, um, you know, people were upset about it. Um, so, and then we went back the, the following year and we entered another demo that, um, that I guess like, well, it crashed the computer. So it was disqualified um, and, you know, started up a relationship with some of these folks where um, they, you know, started to think of us for a while, at least as kind of like pranksters or assholes who were going to make these crashing demos. Um, you know, but eventually they started, you know, we, we started to form, um, just by coming back over and over again and showing them that we were serious about it, started to form more of a relationship with the, with the event. And um, a few years ago, we actually hosted a, um, our own little like micro demo party within their demo party that was for this secret category of the competition called the um, glitch category. And um, so we, you know, and they, you know, it was like a, it felt like one community, you know, we had really kind of like earned a spot in there and earned um, earned some like acknowledgement that this kind of like, this stuff that was built to fail, built to crash or built broken deliberately um, w was something worth looking at. Um, This is uh, some, man, this Zoom is really confusing me. Okay, this is some work by a group that Tomas plays with uh, called Arcane Bolt. Um, that, it, you know, it's like, I think it's, it's super interesting work, but it, it might, be, might be interesting in the context of this talk to kind of bridge the gap between some of this um, psychedelic video art and, and what, I'm, what I'm talking about is like broken. It's noisy um, and it's rough, and it's about kind of exploiting um, dirty signals and stuff like that, and um, foregrounding dirty signals. Um, and I think we have this really, you know, both of us. Uh, that so that project is is Tomas and uh, Mark Beasley and Alex Inglesian. It's called Arcane Bolt. Um, but I think I think we have this real attachment to um, analog video sources cathode ray tube screens and monitors um, as being these kind of like sites of psychedelic, spiritual, magical energy, whatever. I'm, this is just me now, I guess, probably talking about. Um, and, and you can see that all over uh, Kentucky Route Zero, uh, pretty much anywhere there's a television, it's haunted or something. Um, I wanna show you another variation on that Xanadu scene that's uh, also about kind of brokenness and dirty analog signals. This is the same machine, right? But this is when you first encounter it. It's broken. You have to repair it, um, or whatever. You have to you have to intervene. Um, and it was kind of like you know we built the uh, the sort of clean version of it first with all the content in it, and then we went back and and broke it basically, uh, which was like a, a really pleasant, like really kind of liberating, fun experience. Um, but also uh, there was a, I remember there was a moment. Um, near when we released this, where we sort of realized this is really noisy music, like this is really pretty loud and unpleasant. Um, 
and that we were going to ask the players to listen to a few minutes of this. We sort of like had to check some of our expectations, but it, but it was you know I'm glad that we stuck with it. It was um, uh, you know it feels good to put some of that that material out on Steam or something and put that material in front of people. Um, whoops. Sorry, I gotta. Yeah. Cool. <clears throat> Um, so that's a that's about a sort of texture of brokenness or something. Um, but we also have a lot of cases in the game where things are are just broken. Things are broken in the sense that they're not working the way that we want them to be working. Uh, and sometimes, oops, we've we've kind of um, I think nurtured an intuition for when to just sort of embrace those points of failure, those moments of failure. Cool. Seventeen minutes. I can do this. Um, so uh, here's one example of, um, of a breakage that we just sort of decided to own. Um, there, the game is mostly pretty, uh, pretty conservative with the kind of graphics card features it uses, right? It doesn't use like a ton of texture memory, certainly, or anything like that. So it doesn't ha it's not like, not like a very demanding game, technically. Um, but there are some graphics card features um, that cards that are more than 10 years old or so don't support that we use pretty extensively. Um, so here's a, the opening scene of Kentucky Route Zero. Um, we, there, this uh, horse head, the way that the horse head is, is um, designed, it needs to switch between night and day, right? So Tomas is using, um, Tomas wrote the, uh, the shader code to display this. Um, he was using a feature that has to do with like, you know, uh, reading from a texture at runtime or something in order to set the, the colors there. And that's not supported on every graphics card anyway. Um, so we were thinking about, like, how do we get this to still show up on people's cards? You know, um, it, what, what, it would, what it would do when we were, um, when we had released it and, and people's cards didn't support this tech is it, I think it would just disappear or it would just turn black or something. Uh, it wasn't, like, wasn't obvious enough that there was a problem. Things just, like, didn't look right. Uh, so Tomas added this uh, behavior here. If I go ahead and tell Unity to emulate using a graphics card that we didn't support, Tomas added this like fallback shader. So if things went wrong, they would like really go spectacularly wrong. Um, and so this had two benefits. One, uh, a lot of people would see this and just like be cool with it which is fine by us, or they would see this and say, that is wrong, you know? Like, it's not black, it's not gone, it's wrong. Uh, and so they would email us and we would say, oh yeah, your graphics card's out of date. Um, although there was one, um, there was one uh, art magazine, I forget which one it was, that wrote a review, wrote and published a review of the game and, and all the screenshots looked like this and they were, it was like pretty exciting to think that they had just um, gone along with it, kind of. Um, another, uh, example of kind of like folding in these badly behaving code. Um, let me see, where is this video? Sorry. Uh, where is that? Oh, well, let me see if I can, sorry. Okay, I may not be able to Pull this up. I'll just show you in the editor what it looks like. Um, so there's this. Uh, oh, I still have the fallback shader on. That's why that looks like that. Let me turn that off. So there's this this bird, who's a uh, an important bird in the game named Julian. Um, and at a certain point uh, in this museum scene, this is a scene in in the second act of the game. Um, there's a point where the where this bird Julian swoops in and picks you up and carries you away, and it's like a, a sort of dramatic climax of this scene. Um, and you know, it's it's the scene is very slow. It's creeping towards this moment, and then this bird swoops in and picks you up. Uh, and there's like a thunder clap, and there's a lightning bolt, and it's like really dramatic, right? Really romantic. Um, but there's also like a bug right there, and it, w it would crash like right when he picks you up, and it was really. Um, kind of neat, like that it happened at this dramatic moment, but it was really hard to reproduce. Um, we, there's only three of us, we don't have like a, you know, quality assurance team uh, or anything like that. So we couldn't, you know, we couldn't really devote 
the, um, the time to looking for this bug anymore when it wasn't leaving any data for us to sort of isolate what, what could be possibly be causing it. Um, so the way that we solved it instead, or the way that we, uh, like I say, kind of just took ownership of it, um, is we, um, we set a flag in the user's save file right when the bird was about to swoop in, and then we removed that flag after the bird had passed, and we knew that it was safe. Um, so if, you if, you, if the game had crashed and you started up again, and it looked to see that the flag where the bird's coming in had been set, but not the one saying that the bird had finished, it would warp you to this special scene that's just for people who are recovering from a crash, uh, where you know it would be this other character, Shannon, telling the, the um, character Conway, like, oh, I think, I think he passed out. <laughs> he grabbed us really fast, and we went up <laughs> in the air, and it would kind of move you on to the next scene, so we could just kind of dis dispense with the rest of that. Um, so, you know, it, it would have been easy to get wrapped up in wanting, needing for this scene to work the way that we had implemented it and the way that we wanted it. But I think a sort of healthy relationship with the, the broken by design um, uh, kind of, you know, is, is, is what drove us to that decision there. Um, okay. Oopsie. more than you ever wanted to know about my file system. Um. Um, finally, I, I think something that, that we drew from our early work in Chicago, video artwork and, and um, experimental software artwork, um, is a, a really uh, healthy appreciation for collaboration as, um, as like a practice, as like a way of working, a way of being that's not just about the necessity of uh, dividing labor or about the necessity of like filling in um, gaps in your expertise, uh, which is the way that, that we see it get talked about a lot in games. You know, there's like a sort of hyper-specialization of skills uh, in game development and, and the suggestions that you form teams in order to uh, meet all the requirements of this like, you know, really, uh, really strikingly multimedia uh, venture that is making a video game. Um, but, you know, for us, like, s starting our, our, our own art practices in the city of Chicago that has this history of um, collaboration uh, as, as a really important part of, of the kind of art community there, and it's true of a lot of places, um, but it, it sort of, yeah, it sort of, sort of led us to, um, to understand that as being as being really important to our process, as being like a kind of um, deliberate part of our process, not just a strategy. Um, the co collaboration that I'm talking about in Chicago is like, uh, you know, for one thing, this really vibrant music community that um, a lot of it centers around like improvised music, at least the community there that that um, we were a part of. Um, so you know, improvised. Uh, Experimental music, uh, you know, is all is about community and trust for for a lot of it. You know, the audience trusting that the improvisers, um, you know, aren't just gonna flip them off and contact Micah Pinecone for you know an hour, or or that they are gonna do that, but it's worth sitting through anyway. Um, and uh, trust between trust and community between the improvisers, right? Um, that comes from these people valuing uh, collaboration as a core part of their process. It also, also with the, um, this history of video art and digital art in Chicago, software art in Chicago, like the, these folks like Dan Sandin and Phil Morton, their relationship is that Dan Sandin built the image processor, Phil Morton wanted to build a copy of the image processor and they collaborated on making it possible for anyone to copy the image processor. So their sort of collaborative relationship is kind of a really core part of what, what makes the the, uh, this analog video synthesis or the image process are important. Um, so our working process with Kentucky Route Zero um, also kind of has a background in this piece called Magic Matrix Mixer Mountain. Which I'll show a little bit from.
So this was a sort of hybrid performance installation uh, piece that we did in Chicago in, um, I think, 2009. So, you know, there's Tomas, there's me, six years and 60 pounds ago, and this is Mark Beasley, who Tomas works with on Arcane Bolt. Um, and it was this, like, yeah, just tower of, of um, live electronics. Uh, I mean, we had some projections, but also a lot of these monitors, you know, with each of which has their own unique character, and we had stuff, you know, cables are kind of weaving in and out of what we call the mountain, this big just pile of installation that we built over over a week in this space, uh, Lampo in Chicago, Lampo's old space. Um, and so this was, this was a collaboration of about, I think it was like seven people or something, um, where we, there was no like, uh, there was no like process of planning or of like revising or editing. It was just a process of dumping and just a process of building and bricolaging. Um, and that's, you know, some, that's something that we've preserved in our work on Kentucky Route Zero. Uh, there's this uh, writer, Magnus Hildebrandt, who wrote a series of articles about our game, which have a really, they're really great articles and they have this terrible title, Kentucky Fried Zero. Um, so, I wanted to open up the third one, but yeah. Here. Yeah, super level. Um, so Magnus uh, is a really um, intelligent and, and well-read guy, and that's why he likes our game so much. And he wrote this uh, series of articles where he's like picking apart all of the different um, uh, sort of um, references and symbols uh, that we use in the game. And, you know, I think, uh, so he's, you know, identifying the specific buildings that we're um, imitating the architecture from, identifying, you know, specific pieces of art that we're uh, drawing on, referencing in old designs and uh, furniture design and stuff. And it, it's, you know, it's kind of fun for us to see somebody um, uh, I, analyzing it with this level of fidelity um, and this, this, at this fine of grain. But, you know, while this isn't the only way to understand Kentucky Route Zero, certainly it's not um, just a game that uh, can be appreciated through this kind of analysis. Um, it, it does reveal something, I think, about the work, which is uh, that it, it is this, like, you know, bricolage, assemblage, or just big pile of uh, sort of symbols and um, uh, gestures <laughs> and, like, sort of points of reference that Tomas and Ben and I um, bring to it, and, th and that that's part of our process is leaving that stuff in uh, and seeing, you know, like what kind of interactions happen uh, when all that stuff is sort of set next to each other. Um, okay, cool. I think my um, battery's gonna die, but that's, I'm also done, so that's cool, <laughs> great. Um, so thanks. Yeah, yeah. Oh, sure. Being from Chicago, uh, I wonder if anyone uh, has been influenced. Uh, uh, the, the images you make uh, compared to uh, other Chicago artists like Jim Nutt, oh. uh, I wonder if anyone has been influenced by him or Joe Zucker. Uh, I mean, I don't know in in the games, you know, if that's the case. But, but I mean, yeah, absolutely in the um, art community more broadly in but, Chicago. But not, but not in the game. I, I don't know. Yeah, it's it, that's hard to say. Um, it's not something that we're that we're looking at, um, except that you know, like Jim Nutt stuff, and that I mean, that's like really celebrated in Chicago, so we're seeing it. But it's not something that we're looking at uh, um, as a yeah. I don't know, we have Tomas and Ben here also, if, if um, so I don't know, <laughs> um, <clears throat> So this is kind of an observation more <laughs> than a question, but I am interested in your opinion of it. So I guess I, I, I realize more that it's, I feel like almost you're using the games game as kind of a Trojan horse to <laughs> hide art into, you know, and kind of expose this fairly esoteric art culture 
to a more conservative or mainstream audience? Mm. Is that something you're sort of doing very consciously? Like, like you know, that, that idea of, of the audience for the game being, I would imagine, quite different than the audience for your art and the art you're referencing. Yeah. Um, not in like an adversarial way or anything, you know, but um, not like, uh, yeah, but um, I think... Uh, yeah, like, for example, when we put this, like, noise music in that scene and this, like, kind of glitch art in that scene, yeah, we were, we were like, excited that that might be somebody's, um, you know, first exposure to noise music where they, um, where, where they might be compelled to kind of sit through it or something, uh, if that's... Yeah, I mean, I guess I'm more curious about where does that tension come from? Mm. Because it feels like the the game is operating in a very different bandwidth than the other work. Like the game is, as you said, it's very like, you said conservative, but I don't see it that way. But you know, oh, it's like, know. Um, yeah. uh, it's narrative, it's poetic, it's romantic, it's uh, the characters look, you know, kind of well animated. It's yeah. not a kind of glitchy game. Yeah. It's very together and yet, your other interests, all your influences that you've shown are kind of from the flip side. So I, yeah. it's very, I'm really interested in how how it ended up like that. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I, d I don't think, I don't know, um, I don't think of our, our game as conservative either, but but I, I, I kind of kind of have a sense of what you mean that there's, I, I feel like, our, you know, we, we pay a lot of attention to some, some details about um, about what it's like to sit down and play our game, and you know, we want it to be kind of like welcoming in a way that some of this, um, uh, some of this more kind of raw work is not concerned with making itself welcoming, you know. Um, and sometimes it's like, you know, like I said, we just don't, we just don't think about it. You know, we've we've been, we just don't think about this stuff being esoteric or something when we put it in. It's sort of like a part of of, you know, how we think about. The world and how we, you know, it's a part of what we know, you know. So, um, yeah, that's why I say it's not like adversarial so much. It's, it's, but they feel like different. They feel kind different. Of creative impulses. Yeah. Like a, yeah. A kind of a two sides of, a, yeah, of, of a practice. Hmm. Yeah. Cool. Um, hmm. Uh, so I was, I guess, I noticed that there are like so many, I guess what you're saying, like so many layers of, I guess, stuff that you really put into this game, whether it's like the visuals, the sound, the, just like the attention to detail in like every like scene in the game, you're like pointing out like, oh, that's like a synthesizer based on, you know, an actual one, stuff like that. Um, how do you, I guess, how do you, like when you're working on something like this, how do you know like this is, okay, this is done or like this needs more detail or this is missing something. Like, where's your sense of, I guess, completion come from? Or, um, yeah, like this. Yeah, I think it's about this mounting sense of panic as it goes longer and longer before we released it, and and then just, um, um, yeah, this is a war between two anxieties. And it's, no, it's not so pathological as that. But it, um, there, there's not a, there's not like a clean cutting off point. I don't think um, for a lot of this, you know. Yeah, there's there's always right. Yeah, th there's not a clean cutting off point. There's a sort of um, a tipping point maybe where it's like where it starts to feel like it's it's uh, it's enough, but it could be more. But it's enough that it's going to be better to release it than it is to to hold on to it. What what do you th do? You have any sounds accurate? Sounds accurate. Okay, cool. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, we do like we do kind of prioritize stuff that may, you know like some detail like making sure this modular synthesizer that's kind of in shadows in the background is accurate and if we have to spend a few days making sure it's accurate that's sort of a you know I mean that's one of the great things about being um uh that's one of the one of the most valuable things about being able to work in this mode um for for us I think is you know just being able to decide what's important you know like a nice menu or a, you know a menu that's not just like yellow text on a black background um, is not important right now, but this accurate modular synthesizer is important. Uh, you know. Uh, 
Um, you talked a little bit about how your collaboration, there's not such a strong sense of specialization. Um, that's, that's something that I, I agree with, but I've never thought about, and my own reasons are a little, a little weird. And I was wondering what you think you lose with sort of hyper-specialization or what you gain by having more sort of fluid roles. Yeah. Um, well, I think, yeah, I mean, anytime one of us can, can like, cross between things that we're working on, the, the, um, the kind of multi-vocalness of it, it, you know, it really benefits from that. Like, um, and, I mean, just, like, having, like, there's some parts where, um, where, like, Tomas, like, wrote some text you know, the, in the game, I, I write most of the text, but there's some parts where Tomas wrote some text in the game and it's like really, um, it, it just like makes, it en enriches the voice, I think, just to have like, um, have that variation in there. That, um, and also, I, I think what I, what I wanted to really say about specialization um, is not that, not that specialization in and of itself uh, is a bad thing, but but the the kind of utility of specialization is is what I was saying. That's like, that's a, a sort of limited idea of what collaboration can be. You know, that that collaboration is about division of labor or something. That's what I kind of wanted to push push against. Um, and yeah, so our and our work is is like in some in some ways kind of specialized for sure. Like Tomas does all the art, and I do most of the writing and stuff like that. Kind of falls into those roles. But but also like being able that both of us can can write code, that's like a really important part of how the game is what it is, you know, that, that Tomas can be making the art, but then also programming the camera behavior at the same time that he's modeling the environments, that's really important. So, yeah. yeah. Um, can I ask a little bit about your uh, who your ideal player is and sort of and I want to kind of get at motivation. Like you, you tell this sort of very touching story about the colossal cave game, which was designed yeah. for his daughter. And I was just wondering wh what motivates you as a group to work to produce this work. Yeah, um, I mean, we I think we Im we imagine um, a, a player that that's just kind of taking their time and and, <laughs> and listening and exploring and and being playful. Um, you know, being kind of open and playful. Um, it's hard to, you know, it's, it's hard to instrumentalize uh, in our thinking about the player too much. Like, I don't think we really, like, make this um, because, I, I don't think first and foremost we make this because we want other people to do something. We make it because we, we want to do something. Um, but, but, yeah, when we talk about our ideal player, it's definitely, that's a kind of image, that's a kind of person, imaginary person that we talk about as somebody who's, who's being slow and taking their time, and, and um, but, but, but also being playful, kind of jabbing at things and experimenting. Um, and so we d have designed a lot of the game, um, a lot of decisions that we make in the design of the game, I mean, are, are, are there to encourage that kind of play. Um, ask the player to slow down or force them to slow down. Um, and ask them to do things that are not, um, not in the interest of advancing some kind of like linear progressive narrative or something, but ask them instead to, to wander off to the side a little bit or something. Um, so, and I guess there, there's a, like a little bit of an instrumentality to that where, you know, we are, um, we would like to teach players to be like that so that there can be more games for players like that. Um, you know, one group that we're really indebted to uh, is uh, Tale of Tales. I feel like a lot of the time, um, so they, you know, Tale of Tales makes these really romantic, beautiful art games, among other things. Um, and they have for, for a long time, for maybe 10 or 15 years. Um, I feel like Tale of Tales created the Kentucky Route Zero player to a certain extent, you know? Um, and and so, did, so did a lot of uh, really interesting interactive fiction writers and a lot of other, f other, other folks. But I, I think of the audience that they trained a lot of the time when, when I was thinking about KRZ. And I'd, I'd like to hope that we could train an audience like that for, m for more interesting games. Cool. I'm into it already. 
there's there's an adventure in in uh, submerging yourself in a narrative that is made to a certain degree by the the player and by you, mm -hmm. and that's not new. Mm -hmm. uh, 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 in particular, looking back uh, at, at history, that there there are some huge, huge paintings where that mm -hmm. that happens also, and I, I I guess what I'm getting at is where where do you base uh, a very important aspect of of this, which is the aesthetic? Uh -huh. uh, uh, when I think of uh, 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 excuse me, a, a, a crucifixion by Tintoretto that's 45 feet long and has 50 people in it and it takes you time to move across it yeah. and to do exactly what you were saying to to uh, in, in involve yourself in the minutia to to explore the, the the perspective and finally through both your own as a viewer and uh, Tintoretto's genius as as a director mm -hmm. uh, uh, come to the, that central point where, where Christ is being crucified. Mm -hmm. And I wonder how much, uh, how much you're involved with an aesthetic and how difficult it is to uh, manage that aesthetic in, in a computer. Hmm. Is that clear what I'm saying? Uh, I think so. Okay. Uh, I like that you said excuse me just before you started talking about a painting. Like we were What's that? Was that you? <laughs> I, thought, I thought it sounded like you were excusing yourself before you started talking about a painting. Like the, um, I, no, it, it, um, uh, we have a, yeah, we have a lot of, a lot of tools, um, aesthetic tools, you know, in, when making a game. Uh, definitely like the, the visual f as a field is, is one, um, but, but also, you know, we have control over the camera. So a lot of, I think, what I think Tomas does um, really well to kind of build uh, this this direction through a scene is, is working really closely with the camera and the space. So Tomas is designing the camera behavior and the environment, the architecture or, or the environment at the same time. So um, that's that's where I think a lot of our, our motion through the scene, our, our direction of the player through the scene comes from. It's just like this this camera space relationship, which is a, which is um, a lot of that vocabulary comes from cinema, right? And um, uh, that, that which Tomas could speak to better better than I could, but um, so yeah, we, we think and we think about that as an aesthetic uh, tool. We talk about that as an aesthetic tool for sure, and also um, we think and talk about the uh, haptic relationship as an aesthetic tool, like the the touch of the game. You know, this game's about touching things, and in some levels, <laughs> it's about touching the mouse or the keyboard or, or a gamepad. Um, so we we think about that that as uh, an aesthetic level. What's that? Yeah, reading. Yeah, right. Exactly. The interface of the text, like what the what the text feels like moment to moment, as a real time text aesthetic that we're that we're making decisions about. In addition to typography and other kind of like visual kind of field stuff. Um, yeah, architecture. Yeah, yeah, right. And it's yeah, it's real architecture. It's like I mean, it's you know, it's fake. It's virtual architecture, but it's like it has a volume. It has a. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Um, and the space element, yeah. Yeah, yeah that's great. All the line yeah, yeah. And we have some scenes where where the camera doesn't doesn't move cinematically, um, uh, where Tomas designs the environment, thinking very much like a set designer in some ways. You know, where he knows it's going to be seen from just one angle, so things are flat that can be flat, and so on. You know, things are layered in certain ways that. Yeah. Um. Hey, I'm really interested in what you said about brokenness having this magical quality. Mm -hmm. I wonder if you can speak more about that. And I'm also wondering um, if that brokenness always need to be somewhat just opposed to a non-broken surrounding or environment for that magical quality to occur? Hmm. Uh, yeah, the latter part of that, I know that's interesting. Um, I do know that I can get pretty zoned out on like 
analog video glitches and kind of lose track of anything that might not be broken around me. So I, I don't know if that's the case or not. Um, uh, yeah, there's something for me magical about it. I think because it's uh, it's natural. It's uh, you know it's electronic, but it's natural. It's background radiation is involved. You know the uh, the sort of afterbirth of the Big Bang is involved, and there's all this kind of like forces. You know, plus with analog video. Um, analog video that's going out of control like it's like so loud you know and so just kind of visceral that's that's where that's where it be, it feels like like magic to me uh, it's untamed it's it's natural i guess that's the, it's a, it's it's a kind of romantic relationship to it it's definitely like maybe a little bit outdated or something but um as as like um art history goes but that's that's how it makes me feel anyway um and uh you know the, yeah the, then then we um we usually conflate that with it being haunted, like it has a ghost of something, you know, um, in our in our story, which some people have referred to as a ghost story that definitely uh, involves ghosts, um, at least at least symbolically or metaphorically. So, um, yeah. Yeah, well, I mean, I so we got it, it's it's a um, so we started working with Ben here, um, and we asked uh, I met Ben in school also, and we asked Ben to knowing that Ben had done some some uh, work that's at least somewhere on the spectrum of this kind of folk music that we wanted to record, um, asked Ben to record those songs and then also to write some original music for it, um, you know, and so that that that's I think comes from. Uh, what Ben does, like that, that music is kind of what Ben does, that experimental electronic music, that ambient music. Um, and it has a similar, you know, it has a, also a kind of like um, natural quality to it. It's this analog synthesizers and stuff also has this kind of unstable quality to it that I, that I find fits really well. I don't, what, what do you think, Ben, about the, those two together? But also uh, not not um, locating it specifically in one time or one era. So like these, these like you said, these kinds of music that you uh, would never think to put next to one another in the same world are put in the same world, and there's nothing. There's it's not a big deal. It's sort of just like taken for granted. It also I think has to do with the way that the different kinds of music function within the game, like the kind of folk music is always coming from within the frame p being performed by these characters in the in the game whereas some of the other music the electronic music is sort of m functioning more like a like a film score like sort of outside of you know the frame um, and then also yeah that this idea of like the 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 natural and the unnatural or the sort of like their the tech Things that are very overtly technological coexisting with things that are very like overtly like natural or, you know, like computers covered in in mold and moss and mud or things like that. So that just like having those two things coexist in the game, I think, is an important thing. And yeah, I don't know. Sorry, um, I hop in late, so I'm not, I'm, hope this hasn't already been asked. Um, I'm interested, sort of, from a process perspective. Um, when you have like a technical issue, I spent a lot of time in the basement of Act Three, um, exploring how you had this pathfinding in that Jeep, which would do three-point turns, like if you click <laughs> behind you. And I thought, I don't know, like, how does someone, um, you know, spend probably a lot, like a lot of time working on this and still sort of remember what their story and what their game is actually about? <laughs> do you, like find it difficult to sort of 
when working on a very technical issue, um, sort of maintain a sense of theme or just a sense of what you're actually trying to do for the user? Um, I know I do. Like, could you speak to that? Well, I, do, you, do you have a, it's Tomas built that part. I, I wonder, do you have anything about that specific? Yeah. Yeah. There's also like the, the fact that our practices that we make software, you know, so working on these problems is, is part of, you know, it's not, it's not like they're in the way of our practice. It's like what, it's like what we're doing anyway. Yeah. Are there any more questions? <laughs>